This is for the ethics review class at Parker University. HIPAA, of course, is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. These are the privacy rules that uh, have caused so much anguish among doctors. I think it's helpful to think of the rules like fences. In our relationships with other people, there's things we can do and things we cannot do. If those boundaries are clearly defined by fences, either physical or uh, metaphysical fences, but there's a boundary that we both understand in a relationship, it's more likely to be a healthy relationship. Uh, Robert Frost, of course, in his poem said, good fences make good neighbors. If you go back and read the poem, he's really talking about uh, neighbors building a fence like this one on the left, where they work together, uh, building the fence, deciding where it goes and deciding how to build it and construct it. And part of the good neighbors is that process of working together. Uh, fences do not necessarily mean that there can't be a loving relationship. Carl Sandburg said, love your neighbor as yourself, but don't take down the fence. And Arthur Bear said, a good neighbor is a fellow who smiles at you over the back fence, but doesn't climb over it. So the idea behind, or I think the intent behind the HIPAA regulations was to help clarify between doctors and patients, when is information confidential? When is it not confidential? When can the covered entity, the doctor, release that information? Before we get into the specifics, I think it helps to remember the general goals for record keeping. The whole reason doctors started to create records was to help provide better patient care. Doctors were finding as their practices grew and became more complex that they were not able to remember as they moved from one patient to another. They also found that as patient was treated by other physicians, it was necessary to have good documentation to avoid duplication and to keep all the uh, professionals working in the same direction. So it's important to have good records for patient care for you or, or by you uh, to help your memory. It's also important to have good records to help patient care when it's provided by other people so that they know what's working and what's not working and what's been done and what's not been done. Now, in addition to providing good patient care, uh, doctors have also found that good record keeping can also be a good way to help protect themselves from liability. Good records can spell out why a doctor did or didn't do what they did, and it can help defend them in a malpractice or a licensing sanction action. Good records should be accurate. They should always be truthful, and they should be as specific as possible. They should be complete. No communication, no visits should be left out, and they should be kept confidential. Patients should be able to have confidence that their information will not be shared or become public knowledge. Quick discussion about a few Texas rules. Texas, of course, has a general rule that requires confidentiality of chiropractic patient records and communications. So even if for some reason HIPAA does not apply to your practice, you're still going to be subject to those state rules. Uh, Texas adopted HB 300 several years ago, House Bill 300, to help supplement the HIPAA regulations. Among other things, it requires training of new employees within 90 days of them being hired. That training needs to be updated whenever the law changes in a way that affects their job duties. It requires the employer to keep verification proof that they provided the training. Uh, HB 300 prohibits the sale of protected health information, and it authorizes the state attorney general to pursue penalties for health care providers that violate the uh, HIPAA regulations. Uh, general record keeping requirements for Texas. Uh, records for patient care should be kept for at least six years after the last visit. Uh, rule is that it should be kept longer if the patient was a minor at the time of the last visit. Both the doctor and the clinic owner are responsible for arranging to, that the records are kept for that period of time and are making sure the records have the uh, quality and contents that are required to be useful.
So now we move on to HIPAA and the federal regulation. I think it helps to remember a little bit about the history of how this, these rules came about. Uh, when, when you just look at the rules by themselves, it looks sometimes like a convoluted, complicated mess. But if you understand at least a little bit about the process that brought these rules to us, you may understand a little bit better how they became what they are. And the original HIPAA statute was passed by Congress in 1996 when Bill Clinton was president. Uh, privacy rule was first published in 2000 uh, by the Department of Health and Human Service services they recognized quickly that that first draft had a number of problems and in 2001 they published a second draft that was essentially a total rewrite of the rules some of the criticisms that are made of the hipaa regulations apply to that first draft the government did do a reasonable job of listening to the complaints and trying to address the complaints 2003 the privacy rule became enforceable and the security rule was published. Uh, security rule became enforceable in 2005. Uh, Congress didn't do anything with the HIPAA statute from 1996 until 2009. In 2009, they passed the High Tech Act to address some of the shortcomings or, or gaps in the HIPAA regulations. Uh, initial regulations were proposed in the uh, uh, I'm sorry, the regulations became effective in 2013. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is the audit program. Historically, the enforcement of HIPAA has been based on complaints, but starting in 2012, HIPAA engaged in a pilot program where they selected some healthcare providers and audited whether they were in compliance with HIPAA or not. Uh, not surprisingly, nearly all of the people who were audited had some violations of the HIPAA regulations. Uh, last summer in 2016, uh, Department of Health and Human Services started phase two of those audits and expanded it to a somewhat larger pool, but it's still only a few hundred people. It's not become a widespread pr practice at this point, but I do suspect that as the government uses audits, finds them to be a cost-effective way to identify violations, in a cost-effective way to collect fines, they're going to start to use audits more and more often. So a roadmap, what is HIPAA? Uh, the four major sections of the HIPAA regulations are PTSD, privacy standards, transaction standards, security standards, and disclosure of breaches. Those are the four major sections. I think most people, when they think about HIPAA, think only about the privacy standards, and they fail to think about how broad the regulations are and how much they apply beyond just plain old privacy. The four major parts of the privacy regulations can be remembered with NCAA. First part of the privacy standards is a requirement for notice of privacy practices. C is for confidentiality. The records must be kept confidential. A is for access. Patients have a right to have access to their records. They have a right to see their records. They have a right to get a copy of their records. Amendment. Patients may request that their records be amended. The security standards, the three goals of the security standards, or CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Integrity means to make sure the records are accurate, that uh, a hacker hasn't gotten in and changed electronic records inappropriately, or somebody who should not have access to the records has not gotten in and changed the records. Availability means that the records are kept in a way so that they're available, and if a disaster strikes, there's a fairly quick recovery to uh, make those records available again. So pretty simple. The, uh, I'm sorry, the other part of the security standards are the uh, uh, guidelines. They have administrative guidelines, physical guidelines, and technical guidelines are apt. So pretty simple, the, the four acronyms are PTSD, NCAA, CIA, and APT. And that'll help you remember the major pieces of the HIPAA regulations.
So let's start with the privacy standards. Again, this is where most people would have stopped when they thought about HIPAA. And the first part of the privacy regulations is notice, the requirement for notice. And the notice, every time a chiropractor receives a new patient, they must provide the new patient with a notice of privacy practices. They must also make the notice available to anyone who asks for it. The notice should be posted in their office and it should be available on their website. When you provide this notice to a new patient, you should obtain a written acknowledgement. If for some reason you cannot obtain the written acknowledgement, then you should document why you were unable to get it. So it needs to be in the notice of privacy practices. I'm not going to take the time to walk through the rules with you, but what I will do is tell you that the government, Department of Health and Human Services, has prepared a model notice of privacy practices. If you go to the website for hhs.gov, here, let's just do that real quick so you can see how this works. So there's their website, and at the top there's this search bar, and you may search for model uh, notice. Here, I've already done it, model notice of privacy practices. And let's see, the one from the HHS is right here. Now you see it's hhs.gov is in the name. Uh, that'll take you to this page. And then you can choose the type of file that you need. And what they've done is do a, a reasonable job of creating a system that you can customize to put your own name and address on and, and maybe make a few changes to make it uh, fit your practice. But it's something that is uh, fairly easy to read. It's spread out enough to where patients are more likely to read it and understand it. And it just, uh, uh, if you're starting out a practice and you need to develop a notice of privacy practices, this is a quick way to meet that requirement. The C in NCAA is for confidentiality. The general rule is very simple. Covered entity may not use or disclose protected health information except as permitted or required by the privacy rule. Uh, covered entity is essentially every healthcare provider. Uh, protected health information, uh, the easy rule of thumb is, is to, if the information identifies the patient, uh, it's got a name, an address, uh, social security number, date of birth, any information like that that can be used to identify the patient, needs to be treated as protected health information and needs to be kept confidential. Very simple rule, keep it all confidential, except, and of course it's where the exceptions are that we have the uh, meat of the discussion. Uh, before using one of the exceptions, I, I suggest using Benjamin Franklin's advice, when in doubt, don't, unless you are absolutely certain one of the exceptions applies, you should continue to keep the information confidential uh, until you can confirm and are absolutely certain that the exception applies. Once you've released the information, it's impossible to take it back and unrelease it. So don't release it until you are absolutely ready and certain that you should be releasing it. Uh, the first exceptions, it, and I've broken the list of exceptions into two short lists. The first one are the ones that I think you're most likely to see in a chiropractic practice. The second list of exceptions are exceptions you're less likely to see in a chiropractic practice. But remember, these rules are drafted for all types of healthcare providers. So this first group starts off with treatment, payment, and healthcare operations, then incidental disclosures and business associate agreements patient's consent, and judicial and administrative proceedings. Uh, the first exception is for TPO, treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. Essentially, the, these are very broad exceptions that allow doctors to disclose protected health information to carry out their business functions and to carry out their healthcare functions. Uh, treatment means basically what you would expect it to mean, it means providing care for a patient, Treatment includes consultation between healthcare providers and it includes patient referrals. Uh, 
So if you need to consult with an expert about a patient, you may certainly do that and share information with the expert, uh, confidential information with the expert to get their advice. Also, when you're making a referral, it is appropriate and acceptable to share some confidential information when you're sending the patient on to another provider uh, about the patient so they know exactly what you're trying to do. Payment means also what you would expect it means. Uh, these are the activities the company, the healthcare provider goes through to get paid. So submitting insurance claims, submitting information to in, uh, insurance companies, responding to requests for information or answering questions from insurance companies are all the kinds of activities that are going to be permitted as payment activities. Healthcare operations is the general operation of the business, administrative, financial, legal, and quality improvement activities. Re regulations are very clear that marketing is not part of healthcare operations. You should not use protected health information for marketing unless you have the patient's specific consent to use the information that way. Incidental disclosures. Now, I think this exception was created to address some of the concerns with the original draft of the HIPAA regulations. This rule allows disclosures that are incident to an otherwise permitted use as long as only the minimum necessary information is disclosed and as long as reasonable safeguards are in place to protect the information. Health and Human Services has interpreted this rule as allowing some of the common practices that doctors have engaged in for many years. So for example, many doctors have a sign-in sheet on their front desk. And the problem with the sign-in sheet or the concern with the sign-in sheet is the 10th patient coming in for the day can see who your first nine patients were. And essentially what Health and Human Services has said is those sign-in sheets are okay. That's only an incidental disclosure provided that you're not collecting extraneous information. If you start asking other information like date of birth, who's your insurance company, what's your chief complaint, now you cross the line where you're collecting more information than you need to be collecting for that sign-in sheet. And you also need to have reasonable safeguards in place when the sign-in sheet is completed or when the day is completed. The sign-in sheet needs to be put away. It should not remain on the clipboard and it should not be accessible to patients in the future. This incidental disclosure also allows discussions in emergency rooms. Uh, emergency rooms typically have a number of uh, patient bays in a close area, and it's impossible for a doctor to have a conversation with a patient in this area and not have other patients overhear the conversation. Essentially what Health and Human Services is, has said is that conversation is okay as long as it's carried on in a reasonable volume. Um, of course, the doctor cannot be screaming at the patient. And I think it's also a good practice, if possible, to make arrangements to see a patient in a private area if the discussion concerns a particularly sensitive topic. Now, certainly as a chiropractor, you won't be operating an emergency room, but many chiropractic offices are set up with an open adjusting area. And I think this incidental disclosures exception would apply to any information that's exposed during that open adjusting area. So for example, just the fact that somebody is in that open adjusting area identifies them as a patient of the doctor. And that's a release of confidential information, but because it's only an incidental disclosure, it's not going to be a HIPAA violation. Uh, this rule has also been interpreted to allow sending appointment reminders. Uh, you know, many doctors send postcards to remind patients about their uh, upcoming appointments. This rule allows that to happen. It also allows hospitals to keep directories of their patients. The government also recognized that doctors don't contain all the activities within their office. Sometimes they have to bring in business associates who are outside individuals, outside workers, to perform services to help the doctor. So, for example, in a chiropractic office, a typical business associate might be someone who helps process the insurance billing. Now, in that situation, the doctor 
has an obligation to obtain satisfactory assurance that the business associate will safeguard the protected health information. That satisfactory assurance has to be in the context of a written contract. Most vendors who work with healthcare entities on a regular basis have already put the requirements for the business associate agreement within their standard contract or they already have a business associate agreement available. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you need to prepare a business associate contract, uh, Department of Health and Human Services also has a sample business associate agreement. Uh, like the model notice of privacy practices, you can find this pretty quickly using the search box and searching for business associate contracts. And this spells out the terms that are required in that business associate agreement. And in a few cases, it gives you options where you can decide which clause is more appropriate. One benefit of using this agreement if you're negotiating with somebody who's not used to working with healthcare providers is you can point and identify this as a form propagated by the government. And that helps encourage people to do less negotiating and more likely to accept what's already there. The business associate does not have to be monitored by the doctor. Doctor doesn't try to hack have to test their firewall or try to hack into their system. But if the doctor becomes aware that there's been a violation, they either need to make arrangements to cure the problem, prevent it from happening in the future, or if necessary, they need to terminate the contract and retrieve all of the confidential information from that business associate. Uh, this clause or this slide walks through some of the requirements of a business associate agreement. Like I mentioned before, that sample agreement uh, put out by the government is a good place to start. The next exception is when the patient consents. It makes sense if the patient's given permission to release confidential information, that that information should be released. Uh, first thing is the doctor cannot condition treatment based on whether the patient signs an authorization. They cannot tell a patient, you have to sign this authorization first, or I can't accept you as a patient. Uh, the patient has to have the freedom of choice to sign that authorization. There are some specific requirements if the information includes mental health records, uh, drug, alcohol, or substance abuse records, genetic information, or HIV, AIDS, test results, or treatment information. Uh, if you're releasing that kind of information, you want the release to specify specifically that you're authorized to release that information. Uh, quick warning about genetic information. I think many people think of genetic information like DNA test, but they don't think of genetic information as family medical history. But that family medical history is included within the definition of genetic information. So generally, it's a good practice to go ahead and include these items in the authorization and to obtain the patient's specific permission to release this information. A uh, few things that have to be in the authorization it has to include an expiration date. Uh, the expiration date may be none, or it could be an event like settlement of my personal injury case. The authorization also mean, needs to include a statement that the authorization is revocable. Now, I think these types of authorizations have always been revocable, but HIPAA requires that the patient be notified when they sign that authorization that they can change their mind. And I think it's also a good idea to include instructions on how to change their mind. Who do they need to contact and how do they need to contact them? The authorization should also include the purpose of the requested use or disclosure, which could be as simple as the patient's request. The next exception is for judicial and administrative proceedings. Uh, a doctor may disclose confidential information in response to a court or an administrative order or response to a subpoena or a discovery request. It needs to be a proper uh, request. It needs to be from a court with uh, jurisdiction over the doctor. But as long as those requirements are met, the information can be released without it being a violation of HIPAA. 
So this is the second grouping of exceptions, and I think these are less likely to occur in a chiropractic practice. The first of these is other people involved in the patient's care. Generally, if the patient invites somebody to come back to the treatment room, it's okay for the doctor to talk in front of that person. If the patient's not present or the patient's incapacitated, the doctor should use professional judgment to determine what's in the best interest of the patient. Uh, public health activities, any reports that need to be made to public health authorities, for example, reporting communicable diseases, uh, those reports can be made without violating HIPAA. Reports of abuse or neglect. Uh, if a doctor wants to report abuse or neglect, uh, they can do that without violating the HIPAA regulations. By the way, doctors are required to report if they know or, or have reason to suspect that a child is being abused or neglected. Uh, doctors in Texas are required to report elder abuse or neglect, and they're required to report abuse or neglect of disabled persons. They are allowed to report domestic violence, but not required to report it in Texas. Now that may be a different rule in different states. By the way, the report of abuse or neglect needs to be made to the appropriate authority. That may be the health department, a social services agency like Child Protective Services, or a police department. The next exception is for health oversight activities. Uh, if the government is conducting an audit, for example, a Medicare audit, they're allowed as part of that health oversight activity to access confidential information. Uh, law enforcement. Uh, if a crime is committed in a doctor's office or a, a, uh, someone is hiding from the law in a doctor's office, uh, the doctor can provide information to law enforcement to help them do their job. Averting a serious threat to health or safety. Uh, if a doctor needs to disclose confidential information to help protect the health or safety of the patient or help protect the health or safety of somebody else, they are allowed to do that, and that is not going to be a violation of the HIPAA regulations. Uh, De-identified information. If the record has been uh, purged, so that all information that helps identify the patient has been removed, then the information no longer needs to be kept confidential. So for example, if a faculty member wants to show an x-ray to a class, the faculty member can take the x-ray, cut off the portion of the x-ray or block the portion of the x-ray that identifies the patient and show the anatomical structures without being a violation of HIPAA. The exception for workers' compensation is kind of interesting. Uh, essentially, the government recognized that there were 50 different states with 50 different rules. They weren't real sure what to do about this, so basically what they seemed to do was say, whatever the state wants is okay with us. So if you work in the workers' compensation area, you're going to be allowed to make the reports and report the kinds of information that the state workers' comp program requires you to report. So we started off with a real simple rule keep information confidential. Why do we have problems? I think one reason we have problems is people like to gossip. Uh, doctors need to set a good example and they need to make sure they train their employees not to gossip about patients. It's really a good idea to teach them not to gossip, certainly not in the workplace, about other people as well. We also have problems with uh, confidentiality because we're curious. Uh, even those of us who claim to not be nosy are actually pretty nosy and it's a temptation to look at something that's confidential. Um, and the best way to avoid that is to protect the information so that it's not easy to look at, and that gives people a chance to bring their curiosity into uh, uh, check. Using telephones. Obviously, you can use telephones to communicate with your patients, but think about speaker phones for a minute. I don't think it's a good practice for a doctor to use a speaker phone when you're communicating with a patient problem is too many other people can hear what you're saying. And if you find, if you contact a patient and the patient is on a speakerphone, you may want to suggest that the patient pick up the handset before you start to discuss any kind of confidential, especially sensitive information. When you're leaving voicemails or messages on an answering machine, 
I don't know anyone who has an answering machine anymore, but I guess they're still out there. But if you're leaving a message in that kind of context, you never know who's going to pick up the message. So you want to be sure you don't leave a message that includes confidential information. It's okay to leave a message with your name and your phone number asking for a call back, but it's not appropriate to leave a detailed message uh, explaining what the diagnosis is or treatment plan is for this particular patient. Uh, if you're going to send information by fax, be very careful that you have dialed the fax number incorrectly and are using the correct fax number. Uh, if you use emails, be sure you use the same protocol. Uh, text messaging can be a, a, a something you need to use carefully. I think many young people prefer text messages. The problem with text messages is most phones are set up that when they receive a text message, it displays the message for anyone who can see the screen. And that may not be a good way to send confidential information. One thing I, I know that some doctors do is they have the patients complete a questionnaire as part of the new patient intake forms to explain how they want to be communicated with, uh, what phone numbers can the doctor's office use? What the phone numbers can they call? Uh, is the patient willing to receive emails? Is the patient willing to receive text messages? If the doctor's office calls to leave a voicemail or an answer on or, or a uh, uh, answering machine, uh, can they leave a detailed message or should they just leave a callback number? Uh, and if, of course, that helps give the patient some control over how you communicate with them. It can be somewhat of a challenge to administer that, but it certainly makes it clearer to the patient or it makes the patient understand the different channels the doctor may use to communicate with them. Now, we've already talked about the patient sign-in sheet not being a violation, uh, the dumpster. Be sure that records are shredded before they are tossed into the trash. Uh, news uh, stations love doing the news story where they get to walk around to the dumpster behind the pharmacy or the doctor's office or the hospital, open it up, and expose some very confidential, very sensitive information. Now, if you use social media, I guess everybody uses social media nowadays. Let me say when you use social media or when you post things on the internet, be extremely careful that you're not sharing confidential information and be sure you're uh, uh, not expressing information that might identify the patient. Uh, one doctor got di uh, uh, disciplined for making a post on Facebook. Now, the post on Facebook did not identify the patient, but when the patient saw the post and the doctor's gripe and complaint about the patient, the patient recognized themselves. So that was enough for the patient to argue that it was a violation of their privacy because somebody else may have uh, uh, recognized them. Uh, laptops and phones. It's very convenient to keep confidential information on laptops and phones, but if you lose or if those things are stolen, considerable patient information can be exposed. Uh, I'm always amazed reading through some of the HIPAA violations to see how many doctors and staff members seem to be able to leave their laptops on buses and subway trains and how many people seem to have their laptops get lost on a pretty regular basis. The best way to protect yourself if you have any kind of mobile device, laptops, phones, USB drives, the kind of thing that's likely to leave the office on a regular basis, the information on that, on that device should be encrypted, not just password protected, but encrypted. As long as that information is encrypted, even if you lose the device, the information is still not usable to anyone who finds it, and that means it's not a HIPAA violation. Uh, ransomware and phishing. Uh, be conscious of how you use the internet. Be conscious of who you give access to your computers. Uh, I hesitated about adding these two items, but several hospitals reportedly got victimized by ransomware attacks. Uh, that's where a random caller contacts you. The general scheme is that your 
computer is sending out error messages and they want to help you. And the way they help you is they get you to give them access over the internet to your computer. And once they have access to your computer, they download a virus that locks your computer so you can no longer access the information on it until you pay the ransom to get it back. Uh, several hospitals were victims of that. Uh, several hospitals decided to pay the ransom because that was easier than going back to their backup and restoring their computer system. That's not a good situation to be in. That's not a good explanation or a good news headline to see. Uh, bottom line there is you need to be careful about who you give access to your computers. You need to make sure your staff understands that if anyone like that ever calls the office, they should hang up immediately. Uh, that person is, is not, unless that person is known to you as someone who's working on your system, you should not give them access to your computers. So we've talked about notice, confidentiality in the NCAA. The first A is for access. This rule is incredibly easy. If a patient requests information or requests a copy of their records, they have a right to get a copy. They have a right to see a copy of the records. But even though it's an incredibly simple rule, the one of the most common complaints investigated under HIPAA has to do with doctors and hospitals denying patients access to their own records. I just want to make it very clear that there is no reason to deny that access. Even if the patient still owes money to the doctor or hospital, that is not a good basis to deny access to the records. The patient has a right to inspect their records. They have a right to purchase a copy of their records. The HIPAA regulation requires that the record be produced within 30 days. If you practice in Texas, you should be aware that the Texas rule requires that they be produced within 15 business days. Uh, Texas rule also spells out the fee that can be charged. It's basically a fee per, per page. Um, for producing that record. Uh, HIPAA just generally allows a cost-based fee based on copying supplies, postage, etc. Which brings us to the last day in NCAA amendment. Uh, essentially, this is a rule that was created by HIPAA. I, I did not see it in any state rules before this. And the concern was that if records contained inaccurate information, uh, electronic records would allow the spread of that inaccurate information very quickly and very broadly and potentially cause a lot of damage to the patient. So the patient has a right to ask the doctor to amend or correct the records, but the doctor does not necessarily have to, have to grant that request. The doctor may respond to that request by uh, uh, either saying, one, they're going to make the change requested, or two, they can't make the change because the record was not created by that doctor. Uh, for example, if you have a new patient, they may bring you the file from their previous doctor. You cannot change or amend the information that you received from the previous doctor. Uh, the doctor may also say they're not going to make the change because the record is already accurate and complete. If the patient is requesting that you create or make a change to the records in a way that would make the records inaccurate, or would uh, conceal important information, that's not something that the doctor needs to grant. So PTSD are the four major pieces of the uh, uh, HIPAA regulations. Uh, we've ne we're now finished with the privacy standards, the P, we're on the T, transaction standards. This is real quick, it's a, it's a software question. You need to be sure your software is up to date and that it's submitting transactions to insurance companies in the correct format. Use the proper codes, use the codes correctly. Which brings us to the essence in PTSD, the security standards. Remember, the security standards are designed not just to protect privacy or confidentiality, but they're also designed to protect the integrity or the accuracy of the records and the availability of the records to help with uh, uh, disaster recovery primarily. If you look at the security standards, they're essentially written like a checklist. 
Uh, checklists can be very useful, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about checklist. What I am going to do is, is direct your attention to the book, The Checklist Manifesto. It's a short little book. You can read it in, in you know, a very short time. A plane trip is more than enough time to read the book. The book was written by a medical doctor. And he talked about the development of checklist and the use of checklist by surgeons and how the use of those checklists reduced the number of complications in those surgeries. Checklists have a lot of benefits. They help remind professionals, even very smart professionals, not to forget things that are very simple. It helps to communicate between the parties. It helps the parties involved in treating a patient to understand who's responsible for what. And there are a lot of professionals who do use these checklists who uh, uh, benefit greatly from it. Certainly if I'm getting on an airplane, I expect the pilot to be going through the checklist and to make sure everything's taken care of before we leave the ground. The safeguards, the security standards are divided into three types of safeguards, administrative safeguards, physical safeguards, and technical safeguards. Now, I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but there's about 40 or 50 of these items. Some of them are, are somewhat more complicated. Some of them are very simple. So, for example, at the simple end, we have assigned security responsibility. Essentially, the uh, doctor's office needs to decide who is responsible for making sure all these rules are followed. Now, in a small doctor's office, this is not a difficult question. It ought to be the doctor. It ought to be the owner of the clinic. That's it. Uh, it shouldn't be some staff member. Now, in a larger institution, uh, uh, like a hospital, the assigned security responsibility may be a little bit more complicated. But essentially, this, this regulation requires that the person be designated and requires that it be part of their job description that they ensure uh, compliance with these safeguards. One of the more complicated or, or extensive elements is this risk analysis. The regulation requires that the doctor's office identify where all the electronic information is, electronic protected health information is in the office, which may be, I mean, some things are obvious, like the computers, but what about cell phones? What about laptops? What about USB drives? What about digital copiers? Digital copiers have a computer drive in them, and when they make copies, they actually save a copy of what they did on that computer drive. So when a uh, digital copier is discarded or turned in at the end of a lease agreement, that copier still has confidential information on it. You need to make sure the hard drive is erased or removed before that machine is returned. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this entire list, but it's there for your, your information. These are all the headings. Obviously, the regulations include a lot more information about what needs to be, what's required by these uh, uh, security standards. If you sit down and try to comply with these all at once, you're going to have problems. But if you break it down into shorter lists and you do one or two a week, it's fairly easy to work through this list and you can work through this list in less than a year and bring your practice into full compliance with the security standards. Breach disclosure. If a breach occurs, uh, that means that there has been an unpermitted use or disclosure of protected health information, something that's not covered by one of the exceptions, something that is essentially unlawful. The doctor's office is required to notify the patient involved. If the patient needs to take information to take steps to protect themselves from identity theft, the doctor's office needs to notify them of those steps. The doctor's office also needs to report this to the Department of Health and Human Services. In other words, the doctor needs to identify and monitor whether breaches are occurring. And when a breach occurs, they need to self-report to the patient and to the Department of Health and Human Services. That report needs to happen immediately. Immediately. 
certainly no later than 60 days after the breach occurs. Hopefully you never have to use this rule, but if you ever become subject to it, take steps quickly to comply with it. So that's the PTSD, uh, privacy standards, security transaction standards, security standards, and disclosure of breach standards. Uh, finally, I want to make just a few comments about enforcement of HIPAA. Uh, when the regulations were first adopted, I think there were some fears that the government might be very aggressive in how they enforce the rules and how many people were going to wind up going to jail. But in fact, the exact opposite happened. There's probably more criticism that the government doesn't do enough to enforce HIPAA than that the government's doing too much to HIPAA, to enforce HIPAA. The complaint process is outlined by the government like this. And the, uh, for the first many years that HIPAA was in place, the only way these investigated, investigations started is when someone filed a complaint. Unless someone filed a complaint, there was no investigation. Uh, and what the government found is after they received complaints, about 60% of the complaints required no further action. Uh, the government decided, for example, it wasn't even a violation of the rules. So they just take it and file it away, and that's it. For the other 40%, they resulted in some type of investigation. Uh, even in those investigations, many of them found that there was no violation. Or if there was a violation, Health and Human Services was able to obtain voluntary compliance. And in a handful of cases, very few cases, they issued a formal finding of violation. Now, what about these criminal violations? Extremely few criminal convictions exist for HIPAA. Uh, almost all of the HIPAA, uh, last time I looked, there were only about nine convictions under HIPAA. Uh, those convictions almost all, not almost, they all involved identity theft. Uh, someone in the doctor's office, not the doctor, someone in the doctor's office was using confidential information to steal the patient's identity. They were being convicted for that identity theft already and the government simply added the HIPAA violation on top of that. So that was initially from about uh, 2003 to 2011. Uh, 2011, the government started a pilot audit program. Uh, they select, selected a handful of providers and conducted an audit to see if they were in compliance with HIPAA. Uh, they found that 58 of the 59 healthcare providers, nearly all of them, had at least one negative finding, meaning they were in violation of the security rule. Uh, Health and Human Services, shortly after that, started to make plans to conduct audits on a broader basis. Uh, they finally got around to starting those audits in July of 2016. Uh, I believe they audited, audited about 250 covered entities. Uh, including business associates, hospitals, and healthcare providers. Uh, I've not seen the results of that audit yet. Uh, my concern with the audits is that the government may start to use them uh, to help identify people who are in violation and then to assess fines on those people. Um, they've set the audit process up to be a very efficient process. They're, they're desk audits. Uh, if you receive a request or, or a notice that you're being audited, uh, they advise the doctor to go to a website, upload their policies and answer the questions, and then the government decides based on that whether any further action is required. But one of the nice things about the uh, audit uh, program is the government has published audit protocols. Essentially, this is the list of questions that they're asking as they go through. The uh, protocols are extensive. Uh, they're there on the Health and Human, Health and Human Services website. Uh, if you search for HIPAA audit protocol, you can find it fairly quickly. And I'll warn you that if you just look at this table or if you try to print out this table, it goes on for hundreds of pages. It's a lengthy table. But some of these items don't even apply to you uh, and the ones that do, maybe some of them may be very short and simple to, apply, to interpret. Some of them may be a little more involved. So just for example, this first one here, it's under the privacy regulations, uh, using genetic information for underwriting purposes. Uh, 
Well, if you're not doing any underwriting, you're probably not going to have to worry about this rule. Um, and if you look at the questions that the auditor is directed to ask, uh, does the health plan user disclose genetic information? Um, so all these questions are directed towards a health plan, an insurance plan, or an underwriter. So as you're looking at these, remember that the HIPAA regulations apply to a variety of different uh, health care entities, uh, including individual doctor's offices, including groups of doctors, including hospitals, and including insurance companies. And because of that, the, some of the regulations are written in a way that's somewhat more complicated than they would need to be for your particular situation. In some of the regulations, you just flat don't have to worry about it at all. But if you work through this table, you can work through it. It's not in a particularly useful order, but you can work through this table and identify the pieces that apply to your practice and then create a policy or adopt a policy that addresses it. So here's the rule on protecting information of deceased patients. Covered entity must comply with the requirements uh, for 50 years after the death of an individual. So you have to have processes in place to protect the information for that period of time. That's a fairly simple policy to adopt. Um, in a chiropractic practice, it's probably not often that you have deceased patients, but just as a natural course of events, patients will pass away. You need to understand that just because they have passed away does not mean their information is no longer confidential. It's kind of interesting sometimes to watch TV shows where there's this perception uh, where the doctor thinks as soon as the patient dies, they can start telling all the uh, secrets of the patient. And that's simply not what the law allows. So pay attention to this. There's some more information about the phase two of the audit. But the real key I want you to understand as I go through these regulations, this is a time consuming process. It's going to take some effort to comply with it. Uh, take the time to do it. Uh, it's easy to be upset and mad. Remember Nelson Mandela's quote, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. You can be mad at the government all you want over these regulations. They're still there. It's not going to bother the government one bit. Uh, so being mad about these regulations is not going to be helpful. But on the other hand, if you recognize it as an opportunity, use these rules as an opportunity for you as a doctor to do a more effective job of protecting the confidentiality of patient information, to do a more effective job of communicating with your patients about what's confidential and what's not confidential in communicating to your patients how good of a job you are doing to protect the confidentiality of the records, I think you'll find these rules will do a lot to improve your practice and do a lot to help you.